Hello and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's Best of Bristol lecture. Today we have quite a uh, outstanding personality who's going to tell us a little bit more about Bristol. Much, much uh, older, of course, is the story of Bristol than of the Best of Bristol lecture series, which was only brought into life in 2012 by the Bristol Alumni Foundation. Now in 2017, we are supported by the Bristol Institute of Learning and Teaching, and thank you very much for making this lecture series possible. Now today, we are going to introduce you to the ancient, hot and dangerous past of Bristol. Dr. Mary Benton, who is going to be teaching you some things about Bristol and its ancient history, is indeed a geologist at heart. Starting already in 1980, she read for her bachelor's... Whoops. There we are. Starting already in 1980, she began reading for her bachelor's in geology at the University of Dundee, where she then did move on quite rapidly to read for her PhD thesis at the University of Newcastle in 1985. It is since then that she's been teaching all around, starting in Belfast and now at the University of Bristol for many, many years throughout all year groups. And we cannot imagine a better person to bring some of the ancient concepts around town to life more for you today. It is in fact also Mr. Benton, Dr. Benton here, who did of course also uh, make more and more outstanding contributions to our department as a whole, both pastorally and academically. Over the years, she's not supported us only with fantastic research, but also in our outreach to international students, providing uh, support and as well even inviting people around for Sunday lunch and making everyone in our department feel very, very welcome and warm. In the same way, I would invite you all to welcome Dr. Benton today. And Mary, please do come up. Thank you, Daniel. You're, you're very kind. Um, so, as you wander around Bristol's streets today and you go through the squares and the avenues, you can imagine yourself back in historical time. You, you could think of Georgians strutting about in their tight britches, of Victorians and Edwardians pushing their prams up and down the avenue in Clifton. You can get a feel for history. You can get a feel for archaeology as well, and archaeological time. If you take yourself um, slightly out of the city and you go to the Iron Age camps in Lee Woods or you go to the Stone Circle out in the Chew Valley at Stanton Drew. But what you're probably less used to thinking about is deep time, geological time. And that was the thing that, when, when I was young many years ago, really made me want to study geology. It was the enormity of time, the just inconceivable length of time that, that had existed, and the little bits of evidence that we have for it lying around on, on the Earth's crust in Great Britain. And I just want, I wanted to know more about it and, and to study it. So what we're going to do today is take a quick canter through some of the geology that's well within reach of us here in Bristol city centre and outwards a little bit. So we're going to go through from the Devonian period to the beginning of the Jurassic and the end of the Triassic up here. The Earth is much, much older than this time period. We go back to about 4.6 billion years over there. So we're not going back into the very deepest time because the, the evidence for that is not on our doorstep and it's not particularly... It's getting much, much better understood now, but it's, it's still not as obvious as it is um, to us um, looking at slightly younger things. So, if we follow the Avon River from the sea at Avonmouth and through into the city, we see a fantastic array of rocks preserved for us. 
you can walk through time quite quickly because they've been folded and tilted. But whilst it's convenient to be able to walk through time quickly, it doesn't give you the chance to look laterally and see, see what was going on over a wider distance. So for some bits of this talk, we're, we're going to head to the seaside where the, the folds and the tilting are a little less intense and there's more exposed. But we're very lucky to, to have this. It's been quarried quite extensively in the past and the landscape has been altered slightly. It's not an entirely natural feature, although much of it is. So if we look at a geological map as we go through the gorge, so we've got Abbot's Lee over here, we've got sea mills and the sacred Sneed Park up here, and the river comes through the gorge here, and we've got rocks from Devonian age through to Triassic in the city centre here. So we'll go through some, some of these layers and we'll pass through time from about 410 to 359, 60 or so million years ago. But first of all, let me introduce you to an elderly Scotsman. Um, this is Dr. James Hutton, who is really one of the fathers of geology. Um, he was a leading light in the Edinburgh Enlightenment in the 18th century. He was a medical doctor. He was an experimental agriculturalist. He was a gentleman farmer. He was something of a philanderer. And he was a great thinker. One of the things that he propounded was that if we look at what's going on in present environments, what we can divine from that is very much the key to the past. He developed the principle of uniformitarianism. As he walked around Scotland and travelled around on his horse and looked at interesting things around the coast near to his farm in Berwickshire, and as he wandered further afield, he saw features preserved in the landscape and in the rock record that looked very, very similar to the things that he saw going on in highland rivers, around the coasts, and so on. And he realized that the Earth must be much, much older than the previously held biblical chronology suggested. He realized that we must be looking at very much more than thousands of years of Earth history. And, but he, he couldn't quite work out how long it was, but he knew that processes had been going on for far, far longer, that physical processes had remained the same through many hundreds of millions of years. Perhaps um, we now realize not all of them pertained really early on in, in the history of the Earth, but certainly amongst the things that we see around today, it is quite easy to apply modern principles to older things that we see and unravel what was going on. So that is, that is James Hutton. Um, a geological hero to our earth scientists in here. So let's go to the early Devonian, to the oldest rocks that we're going to look at. Here is a reconstruction of the position of the continent 390 million years ago. The British Isles are this red blob here. And you can see that we were sitting somewhere 15, 20 degrees south of the equator at that time. We're located on the edge of a narrow strip of sea. And you can see the disposition of other continental blocks. We've got a big southern continent. We've got a relatively new bit of continent here that contains Scotland in several slices and it um, contains our area of interest today here as well. So what was, what was the landscape like in a bit more detail? So this, this is a map of the British Isles coming towards the end of the Devonian and this 
painting here shows what it looked like round about that sort of time. So the Mendip Hills are somewhere on this rather arid looking coastal plain. We've got a shallow sea down here over that very respectable area of Tor Bay. If you scruffle about in the quarries on the shore there, you can find wonderful marine communities of fossils and corals and all sorts of things. But here we're on a flat and arid plain, cross-cut by some high-energy rivers, which are deriving their sedimentary material that will be turned into rock over time from places like Snowdonia, North Wales, and you, you can just see the Pennine sort of areas and, and the Lake District um, popping in at the top there. So down to the south, over Devon and Cornwall, we're seeing bits of ocean crust from that closing sliver of ocean being pushed up onto the land, being obducted. And we've got a bit of much higher ground here over the Midlands, and we're sitting somewhere in here on this, this um, embayment on the coastal plain. So it's terrestrial, it's low-lying, it's hot, and for the most part it's dry, though it's getting a bit wetter as we go through time. So if we go to Porter's Head, which is sort of Brist Bristol on sea or Bristol on mud on the Severn Estuary, um, you can see a sequence of rocks recording the fluvial, the river deposits that were laid down at the time. We've got channel deposits, we've got um, mud rocks that belong to floodplain deposition, which were laid down in shallow lakes and during flood events. And if we sniff about amongst those, those rocks, we can find evidence of the things that, that lived in this somewhat hostile environment. We find scales of some of the oldest fishes that we, we know about. There are armoured fish with, with really nasty toenail-y type scales on them. Um, and these scales are preserved and relatively e easy to spot. So we've got some huge organisms that liked living in the ponds, then there were different ones that liked living um, in the more oxygenated and energy-rich channels. We've got some curious uh, fossilised scorpions and these things called eurypterids, which are a sort of arthropod that are related rather to arachnids, um, which are, <coughs> and, are now extinct. But if, if you look about in this lot, you can find evidence of all these organisms. So there's, there's our hot and arid floodplain. If we go onwards into the Carboniferous, we can see that Britain has, the British Isles have now crossed, crossed the equator. We're much closer to the coast. That's because worldwide sea level is rising and it's covering that coastal plain that um, we, we just saw. So we've got a shallow sea. We're so near the equator that those seas are going to be really warm and we're going to see all sorts of interesting life forms flourishing in them. If um, we want to know where they are very locally. All these things are well exposed in these grey limestones in the Avon Gorge. And here is a painting of the locality. So a lot of those northern hilly areas have been worn down considerably. The sea has transgressed over this coastal plain and Somerset is sitting around here in Bristol a little bit further north. If we wander around the bottom of the gorge or along the sea coast where these rocks are exposed, we can find evidence of life in abundance. We can find fossil corals, things like this um, cyphodendron here, 
This is it in a mock-up in life. There are crinoids, which are extant today. This species of coral isn't, but there are interesting cephalopods. There are all sorts of things living on this sea floor. And they're things that, even if they have extant forms today, need to be in well-oxygenated waters in warm places. They secrete calcium carbonate. And that calcium carbonate is what forms the limestones that we see. And when these organisms die, they fall to bits and fragments make up limestones for us. But corals are quite interesting beasts. They record incremental growth with bands of calcium carbonate. And these things are rather analogous to tree rings. And the width of the rings and the natures of the rings reflect changes in light and temperature through time. And people who slice corals up for, for pleasure and look at them under um, all sorts of different microscopes and electron microscopes have worked out that days have been getting longer through time. It's been calculated there were about 400 days in a Devonian year, we're down to about 391 in the Carboniferous, we've now got 365. And this is because the velocity of rotation of the Earth is diminishing through time. And it's thought that the diminu diminution of the speed of the rotation accelerated, particularly in times when there was um, there were a lot of shallow seas at times of high worldwide sea level. So the Carboniferous was a time when this condition pertained and when the Earth slowed down at a relatively more rapid rate. So we've got an um, interesting little side story. If we go and look at our corals, at the things like Siphonodendron and at things that existed further back in geological time. But our limestones locally contain all sorts of fragments of other things, and something you'll, you'll find in abundance if you look, look at outcrops in the gorge or if you look at Edwardian, Victorian stone walls in Clifton that have been weathered, you'll find masses of old crinoid particles there. So crinoids are sea lilies. They're a sort of echinoderm. They're extant today. They live um, below the fair weather wave base. They like well oxygenated warm waters. They're made up of lots and lots of little plates and circular um, pieces called ossicles, and they're very, very important in building these limestones that, that we see locally. There are other indicators of tropical conditions. In, in the gorge again, and down towards the Mendips and up in South Gloucestershire, we find occasional bands of oolitic rock. This building is built of oolitic limestone, um, but from Bath and of a much younger age. But oolids are things that are biologically assisted chemical precipitates. And in modern environments, they only form in places where there is significant aridity for a large part of the year, where the seawater is evaporating and small crystallites of calcium carbonate are precipitating out from the water, rolling on the seafloor, being glued in a snowball fashion around a nucleus as the particles roll in the surf. And we find beautiful white oid sands in modern times in places like, like the Bahamas. So when you're walking round Bristol on a day like it was at 10 o'clock this morning, it would never strike you that this had once been a beautiful um, tropical sea, but it was. So we've not got to anything dangerous or hot yet, but let's... Let's change that. This doesn't look very dangerous. This is a cliff at um, 
a peninsula called Middle Hope, which is near Western Supermare. You might think going to Western Supermare could, could be construed as dangerous, but that's not, not the dangerous thing in question. So we've got limestones of very much the same age as the ones that we've been looking at in the gorge. The succession is the same. But if we go down to a bay um, on, on the coast, um, this is at the far end of Sand Bay, which is just north of Western Supermare. We can see a fantastic succession through the geology there. And we've got ribs of rock that are resistant to erosion and that stand up to it. So we've got them here and we've got big cliffs at the back here and we've got a couple of interesting um, bigger ribs here and then a few little others sticking out through the eroded mud and so on. And if we look at these things in a bit of bit more detail, we see that we've, we've got these tilted limestones here that are weathered to give us a beautiful surface chock-a-block with crinoid fossils with bits, bits of shell. So classic limestone. And then we've got a lot of stuff that's eroded away. Um, not quite sure what that is, um, but this bit that's a bit better preserved will help us work it out. So this is a gray, sludgy green rock full of fragments of limestone. It's got a few fossils in it, oddly, um, and it's got pebbles of what look like volcanic rock. This is volcanic ash. This is something that exploded out of a volcano, which is perhaps unexpected. And in places, we can see that this volcanic ash has settled down through the seawater. It's become a stable environment for a reasonable length of time, and we can see that it's been burrowed by all sorts of invertebrates, and the bedding has been disturbed. We know the water was shallow because we've got some beautifully preserved ripples where the stuff has been worked by oscillating currents in our tropical sea. So we've got successive layers of these explosive rocks. But if we move a little bit further to the right of that first picture I showed you in the bay, we see these big black rocks and they're sort of blobby, you don't see any bedding in them. Um, they, they don't on the face of it look terribly exciting. But if you get your nose down on them, you realize you're looking at igneous rocks, you're looking at something that came out of a volcano. And more specifically, we're looking <coughs> at pillow lavas. And pillow lavas are rocks that form when um, volcanic lava is extruded into water. And as it's extruded into water, it develops a hard shell and it sort of flows out of tubes in these hard shells like toothpaste out of your tube. So I've got a clip here of some modern pillow lavas forming around Hawaii. But this was the sort of thing that was happening. There's, oh, I shouldn't have touched that. Um, you've got your hard outer crust going black quickly and then this lava flowing within the slightly hardened tube that's, that's been left behind. This makes the water steam. You'll be able to poach eggs in the sea if you happen to be passing by. And you get these long tubes of slightly malleable material. And they develop on top of each other and have a very particular appearance to them. And if we go back to Sand Bay, we can see with the eye of faith um, lots of these tubes of black basaltic magma sitting on top of each other. And we can see old gas bubbles in them, which have later been filled in by um, calcium carbonate. 
So there we've got the effusive phase that followed the exploding phases that were represented by the volcanic ash. And if we look at the sequence through the series at Middle Hope, we can see there were several phases of explosive activity interspersed with re-establishment of our limestones, of our carbonate secreting organisms, and then this, ex this effusive lava um, extrusion. And then we return to the quiet sedimentary environment that we saw before. It's very unusual to find volcanoes going through rocks of this age in this part of the British Isles. Carboniferous volcanoes are quite common in the Midland Valley of Scotland, but not, not down here. And it's also very unusual to see volcanoes exploding through limestone sediments. So the location of this volcano is now offshore. And to the west, how do we know that? Quite a, uh, Faulkner 1989 mapped out these layers of volcanic ash very, very carefully. And um, our section that we've been looking at is just here. There are the pillow lavas, and here are the layers of volcanic ash. The layers of volcanic ash get thinner and thinner as you go further eastwards, even eastwards along that peninsula there. So the easy inference is that the source is further away to the west. And there must have been something much more vigorous than our pillow lava extruding vent there to produce these explosions up, upwards to, to give us our volcanic ash. And we're something like 40 kilometers south of the shoreline at the time that these things were exploded. So nice submarine volcano coming up and blasting into the area. But the picture changes. The sea level falls and continental blocks start to come together to build a much bigger supercontinent. We've migrated a little bit further north and by the late Carboniferous the environment has changed considerably. The, we're again north of the equator. The earth has become colonized by land plants. Land plants only started to get a hold, really, at the end of the Silurian, the beginning of the Devonian period. They were small, puny little things that you would consider to be weeds if they appeared in your garden. But by the end of the Devonian, we've got some things that are tree-sized. By the time we get to the upper Carboniferous, we've got forests of much bigger plants. And one of the effects of these forests is that oxygen levels have shot up they now average something like 21% um, of atmospheric gas. They were at about 35% in the late Carboniferous and going into the Permian. And this enabled some quite horrifically large arthropods to develop. There were dragonflies the size of seagulls. Um, this is a millipede called Arthropleura that's about a, a metre, metre and a half long. Um, these things lived on the forest floor. Arthropods like these respire th passively through spiracles. They absorb oxygen into their systems rather than having lungs. So this added oxygen makes this much, much easier. And if we look at bedding planes in rocks of this age, I have to say there are none locally. These, these, these are much better preserved in Scotland than they are here. This is at, at Crail in Fife. 
some of our students will have seen these things on the Isle of Arran on our first year field trip. But you can see trackways from these things that are 30, 35 centimetres across. This wasn't the sort of thing you'd want to tread on as you were walking barefoot across your kitchen floor of an evening. Um, quite large, crispy and crunchy things. And the forests that gave rise to, to this oxygen can contain some plants that would be familiar to, to us today. There are, if, if we look in, in the coal tips at places like Pensford, south of Bristol, or if we dug a particularly deep hole in our allotments at Ashton Gate, we might hoik out a bit of shale or sandstone with impressions of old horsetails or ferns on them. But some of these things grew to many tens of meters high. And they weren't trees that we would recognize today, but there are smaller versions of these, certainly in, in the Botanic Garden, the University Botanic Garden in Bristol. If you walk through their, their paleo um, section, you, you can see um, modern survivors of these, these sorts of plants. And there were coal measures deposited all over the, the Bristol district. And there were coal mines um, in Easton, in Ashton, in Kingswood, that only closed uh, sort of early in, in the last century. And all these plants um, reproduced in great abundance, died, and formed coal. So, as we go through time, things change again. We're moving further and further northwards. We're in the late Permian period now. And you can see that there is a supercontinent here. This is the continent of Pangaea. And we've got mountains to the south of us. We've got a subduction zone over here. But we're on the uh, landward side of those, those mountains. So we're at a latitude where really um, strong northeast winds today blow over from the ocean. And these winds blew over our Permian supercontinent. And they blew over the, the British Isles and they shifted about any loose sediment that happened to be lying around. We find fossil sand dunes, not in Bristol, but in other places in, in the British Isles. We have very little evidence of Permian sedimentation in um, the Bristol district, so there was not much going on from the depositional point of view. But if we look at the structure of, of the area, we see that other things have been happening. This is rather an elderly map, but it's, it's about the most recent publication about the structure of our area here. And we can see a series of folds with an east-west trend that belong to the Mendip Hills. And then we can see them beginning to swing round to the north-northeast as we come towards Bristol. So we've got folds. We've also got some major faults, thrust faults. And if we go back to our geological map, we can see that there are a couple of these trending through the Avon Gorge. So what is recorded as T4 on this map here is the Avon Thrust Fault, and you can see that it is laterally very persistent. So what, what was going on? What, what produced this? If we look at a cartoon of a more regional scale, we can see that this southern continent, Gondwana, had banged into the um, Euro-American continents that we had been sitting on. We've got ocean floor rocks abducted onto um, the toe of Cornwall on the Lizard Peninsula. And going ahead of that collision zone, there are a series of faults that become progressively more gentle as you 
uh, of folds and folds that become progressively more gentle as you, you head northwards. So if we go to North Devon, which is much nearer the, the impact zone and the orogenic front, we can see some really tight folds in the seafloor sediments there. So zigzag folds at Heartland and at Bewes and places like that. But if we come northwards towards the Variscan front, which ends round about the Bristol level, we, we can see much more gentle structures. And these have formed periclinal folds. The Mendip Hills, things like Blackdown and Broadfield Down are folds with this sort of shape. So we've had a continent moving from the south up against us producing both low angle faults that are pushing older rocks over younger and producing these northward verging asymmetric folds. And here's a BGS cartoon showing the process. You've got older rocks being pushed over younger ones. And if you carry the process on, you get to a situation that gives us the present day cross section through Blackdown, that one of those east-west Mendip periclines. This is the surface down to which it's now been eroded. So we've got this asymmetric fold that's getting towards the, the edge of the Variscan origin. But if we come much closer to home and we wander along to the junction between Bridge Valley Road and the A4. We've got one of these, fault, one of the <coughs> these faults really well exposed. So here is the Clifton Down limestone, which is older than these reddish rocks here, which are the Upper Cromhall sandstone. And you can see the fault plane there. And the right-hand side has moved up over the left. And as it's moved, this more competent layer of rock has folded up the less competent layer underneath and produced this little mini fold. This tells us probably that the, that fault was moving relatively slowly. And we've certainly seen about minimum 120 meters or so of movement on that fault. So that is quite a major structure. And remember what its lateral extent was. It went from, at least from the coast, all the way over towards Bath. So this was a big event, a big series of events. And if we look at some vertical um, sections through this mapped area, we've got a couple of cross sections that have been drawn to show us just how much crustal shortening occurred when these two land masses collided with each other. So the A section goes down here, and you can see what a deconstruction of the geology now would look like, what it looks like now. This is the B section over here, here it is deconstructed, here it is as it is now. So we've seen about 40% crustal shortening there. That is um, quite something. So we had major reverse faulting, producing considerable seismic activity down in the gorge. We can't really tell what the earthquake magnitude would have been or how many events it might have taken to produce that movement. We don't know how much overburden there was. We don't know whether the fault broke the surface. We're not really sure where the epicenter or the focus were or what the expression on the surface might have been. But what is sure is that if this happened today, even in a number of steps, there would be major earthquakes, there would be structural devastation, and we would require international aid. So dangerous and a good thing that um, things have become more stable since. But 
things are stable only, only relatively. We have a legacy from this varisca neurogeny that we can see down in the Avon Gorge very, very well. Um, it's structurally unstable. That faulting has broken up the bedding planes. The, the rock is much more fragmented than it would be had that faulting not occurred. And things have to be done to, to keep us safe. So in the 1970s, a concrete rock shelter was built under the Avon suspension bridge there. And it catches rocks and stops them falling down onto the carriageway. Extensive repairs had to be done to the area very close to the fault in 2011. The road was closed for a long, long time. Loose blocks were taken off, the rocks were netted and rock pins were put in. And there were huge engineering works at that time. But if you walk along the gorge, either at the top or the bottom, you can see an awful lot of remedial work that's been done to keep that road safe. So let's move to our final time span. Let's go to the early Triassic and we can at last see the British Isles on the map here. We can see that this Pangaean supercontinent is starting to split up. There are little tongues of the sea coming in here and there and down here. We're still um, much closer to the equator than we are now. We're still in a semi-desert. And we have evidence for this in Bristol City. We have it round about. So there were three types of rock that were deposited at this time. We've got very high energy rocks that were deposited around the margins of our Variscan highlands. We've got rocks that were deposited out in the valleys between these folds, much lower energy environments on floodplains and as a result of um, flash floods. And then we have representatives of wetter phases. When there was more rain, there were more rivers working through our desert basin. And these deposited the sandstones that we see in the Red Cliff Caves under um, that part of the city, which we see as we come into Temple Meads on the train, those um, red cliffs in, in the sidings just before you come in. And the Red Cliff Caves were excavated to get sand out for glass. It's very high quality sand. It's been blown in desert environments. All the muck has gone. Dig it out, heat it up. It'll give you decent quality glass. So what was the landscape like? So we've got our high ground of the Carboniferous Limestone and, and the folds over South Wales and um, We've got Quantock Hills down here and Wessex over here and there is a deep valley going up, um, up here towards Worcester. And it was, it was a pretty barren landscape. There were a few plants about. There were all sorts of alluvial fans and desert things blowing around. And we see the very first of our mammals at that point. Little hairy things that look a bit like shrews. These unfortunate beasts were wandering about on the land surface. If they weren't looking where they were going, they'd fall into cracks in the cast in the Carboniferous Limestone and be entombed forever until people like our paleo group come along and dig out material from these fissures, dissolve it in acid, and then find the teeth of these little creatures, find their jaw bones, reconstruct them. So these poor little things that were snuffling about on the Triassic surface tell us a huge amount about um, early mammal life. So what how, how do these three sediments relate to each other? So our very coarse ones, those conglomerates, form around the margins of our, our Variscan folds. So they form in old wadis that developed around the margins. 
and then they fine out as you go in, into the valleys and then you get your occasional river deposits. So an environment perhaps not dissimilar to some of these Western USA dry valleys today where you've got um, deep canyons coming out of the hills and depositing in flash floods um, debris flow deposits of material down on, on the valley floor. And these little incursions of Triassic conglomerate into these hillsides um, formed by debris flows. And these are pretty hazardous things to get in the way of. You, you, you'd not want to be near one of these. So forget the trees, and then you could, oh, I've done that again, and you, you could be back in, in the Triassic with these horrible flows carrying vast amounts of rock that had been eroded off during all those um, million years of desert, being carried down um, to a break in slope at the toe of our hills. And there's, there's a patch of this stuff on Bridge Valley Road, but it's, it's a bit covered in slime and plants. So, um, but it, it's certainly there. So next time you're wandering around Bristol and you, you see a bit of rock, get excited. Um, have a look at it, see if you can date it. Um, see if you can see some of, some of these organisms and particularly on a dreary winter's day, imagine yourself in, this, in one of these deserts or um, in dipping your toes in the tropical sea or whatever. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Mary? No. Hello. Um, I love the idea of one whole continent. Extraordinary. How, how do we know that there, there was one whole continent linked together? If and, we, and how could that ever happen? Um, it, it happens um, through plate tectonics. The bits of continental crust move about. Um, Sort of driven by convection currents down, down in the mantle, for example. And there are various organisms which have quite a restricted um, geographical range, which are found on different bits of continents. And then when you fit them together, you can see that they must have been together. So, so there are various fossil reptiles and plants that are found in patches in South America and in Africa that w when you fit those together ac actually belong to each other. And if you go further back in geological time when there have been other um, bigger continents, you can find areas that were once glaciated, for example, um, at exactly the same time that, that fit together. So, so there is... Um, lithological evidence, there is paleontological evidence, um, and geophysicists can reconstruct um, the, the pathway of, of these plates um, through time. Um, I'd like to thank Mary for giving the best of Bristol lecture, and I'll pass over to Steve Bullock. Um, thanks very much, Mary. Let's uh, thank Mary once more for uh, a fantastic lecture. Um, I learned a lot, and I'm going to look uh, with fresh eyes next time I'm cycling down the gorge or uh, up the Mendips, which I normally curse at. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I'm one of the supporting academics for the, the Best of Bristol Lectures. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to work with everyone that's been involved, uh, from Dr. Stephen Proud's opening lecture on the death of the lecture, um, through to, to Mary's closing lecture today. Um, the Best of Bristol Lectures uh, were originally uh, founded in 2012 by a group of undergraduates who were uh, inspired by uh, quotes from people such as Steve Jobs, who made much of the value of skipping their own lectures and attending other people's. Uh, and, and they're a celebration of, of cross-curricular learning and, and excellent teaching across the university. Um, 
in recent years, the series beca has become a much more uh, integrated part of the university calendar, uh, and it's now fully funded by the Bristol Institute uh, for Learning and Teaching uh, and supported by the Students' Union. Um, it's still run by the students and for the students, uh, so on behalf of uh, the Built uh, and the University of Bristol Students Union and all of my student and staff colleagues, I'd like to thank uh, the student committee and team who have led the nomination and selection pr uh, process and, and arranged uh, and run the lectures. Um, I hope it's been a, a valuable and a rewarding opportunity for all of you. Um, colleagues at the Students' Union who uh, have supported with promotion and marketing, um, our new friends at Unique Media who have taken things to a, a new level by streaming things live, uh, and there were a fair number watching on, on, on the internet today, uh, I noticed. Um, please take advantage of the catch-up opportunity for any of the other lectures that you've missed. Um, the brand new Bristol Institute for Learning and Teaching, uh, who, like I said, have funded the series, do keep an eye out for developments on the teaching front around the university from then over the coming year. Um, thank you to everyone who is engaged uh, and attended in person and online. Um, and we do hope that you've been educated and inspired by the series as well. Uh, and of course, our fantastic crop of 2017 Best of Bristol lecturers, uh, of whom Dr. Mary Benton's closing one has been one of my favourites. Uh, so thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to officially close the series uh, and see you next year. <laughs>